All other views and opinions expressed here are those of the individual speaking and may not be representative of Coding American. At times, language may be considered vulgar. Listener discretion is suggested. You are now listening to the Coding Behind the Wheel podcast. What's going on? Welcome to another episode of Wheel Wednesday. I'm Scott from Koenig. With me is Nick from Koenig. What well, up? not with me, but, you know, with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, welcome back. We hope this uh, this little podcasty thing finds you well. And uh, I don't know. How's it going over there for you? Oh, you tell me. <laughs> oh, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Uh, not bad. Just working on some uh, some projects. Got some fun yeah. stuff coming out Friday. Um, That's right. You know, uh, pretty much it. You know, staying inside. Uh, worked on the CRV this weekend. That was fun. Nice. I yeah, spent. Everybody likes to work on that. Spent a decent amount of time underneath it. I I replaced all the suspension components in the front end. Control arms, tie rods, uh, ball joint, everything. It's all replaced. It's all good. I don't have to stress about it. Nice. Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> fun isn't the word I would use. But yeah. <laughs> Luckily, so, so, no bolts snapped. I, I, was, I was really hoping. I was like, damn. I, it looks kind of rusty. I hope uh, nothing snaps. But all good. So Yeah, that is pretty much the, the worst thing ever. When you spend more of your time drilling out hardened steel bolts than you do actually fixing anything there was one slight issue i couldn't get uh one of the ball joints out and it, it was just like a huge well i couldn't get the lower control arm out of the ball joint and it was just like it was wedged in there i was like oh, i had to go get the, the other one i banged out i had to go get a ball joint separator yeah and, and what'd you use the fork um no, they have that it, that really cool Honda tool where you like put it in between the wedge, and just tighten the nut down. Yeah, yeah, that one. That's what I use. Yeah, that that's the one. That's the one to have. I I have one of those. Yeah, you're good. It was, it was pretty cool. It just went. So doo-doo. anyhow, moving moving on past Nick's dilemmas, um, <laughs> one of the things that Nick mentioned just a few few moments ago was a piece of po- uh, content that we have coming out on Friday. By the way, before we get into this thing, if you wouldn't mind throwing us a like and subscribing <laughs> down below, uh, we seem to always miss that till about minute 40. Uh, but anyhow, one of the things that's interesting is the piece of content that we have coming out this Friday, and this Friday, I promise it will be out, is uh, related <laughs> to and, and kind of started uh, via a car conversation that happened around the office. And, you know, I, I think a lot of our... Uh, podcasts or different subjects uh, they always Come start with <laughs> yeah because you know we have a lot of ridiculous and hypothetical car conversations around the office and then you know only I would say only about 20% of them are actually worth anything right um, but we had a conversation and it led to the piece of content that you will see on our YouTube channel uh, on Friday so another conversation that we had not too long ago was the debate, right? It's a debate that I think only happens inside of the companies, and I figured, well, it'd be cool to kind of talk about it with, with some of our uh, you know, viewers here because you guys have come, become such a part of a consistent you know, sounding board and, uh, and comments. You know what I mean? We get so mm-hmm. many comments now that like the same people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so here is the here is the debate. Uh, we've been in plenty of movies and television shows and, and different things like that. So the debate is doing stuff like this. Is the product placement worth it for for a company? Uh, you know what kind of things? Uh, television, movies. Uh, you know what kind of things are worth it, and how do companies kind of think about what? what makes sense for them right like how do we know um if it's a if it's a worthwhile venture right i mean yeah i mean how does that even work like how how do you even get your product into something like that like um 
like for certain movies, like it, is it scenario based? Like, will a certain movie, like let's say if they if they need wheels, will they come to you and be like, hey, we need wheels for I don't know a, a stunt car or something like that, or a car we're trying to blow up, or I don't know something like that, and be like, hey, like you know, you can get your wheel in this, just give it to us, and then maybe they pay yeah. you, or like do you have to pay? Like, like how does that work? Like, I would imagine so, if you did like a television ad, you'd have to pay, but. It, it you know it all depends. Yeah, I think every, I think every circumstance is completely different. And um, you know, I, I you know I know I've seen a lot of different circumstances. So there's so let's run through a few of them real quick. Obviously, there's paid product placement, which is what you would see from companies like Coca Cola, Pepsi, all the big companies that would um, they would pay to have their in, stuff in in movies and stuff like that. Right, yeah, like a lot of the things which you don't, you know, and if, and if you look, some movies are better about it than others, but, you know, most likely when you, no, <laughs> always, when you see, when you go in and you happen to see the character, even if you're in a microsecond and he's drinking a Coca-Cola and you can clearly see the label, if you, you know, if they drive through a McDonald's drive through if they, you know, all these things are product placement that are designated and designed to be able to, um, work in sponsorship dollars into movies, shows, etc. Right. And, you know, for the people that have never thought about it before, um, you know, from a marketing perspective, that's how it works. Because big movies and stuff like that, they would never use your logo, which means that they would never show. And that's why, like, you'll see a lot of different movies and they'll have like ripoff names instead of calling it McDonald's or be McDougal's or whatever it is, um, and and they do and they'll do different things like that because of the fact that they don't want to pay the company to uh, to use their logo. And the other thing is uh, a company they have to, every time you feature a logo into something like that, you'd have to go and get express uh, consent. And right. usually for companies that are of that nature and that size, it's not as easy because those companies, they want to see the whole film now before they would allow you to go ahead and use that. The problem with that whole thing is, is that a lot of times this movie isn't done to show them until afterward. And then what do you do if they say no? Go back and reshoot? Yeah. Like, so, so you will notice that all product placement that you see in movies, that is direct result of some sort of you know agreement um now it's different every movie has a different rank on the totem pole and every sponsor has one too so you know um for a company like coca-cola if they want to be in a bunch of movies um in a in big dollar movies they may pay a lot of money for a company like coca-cola that's in an indie movie and there's somehow relevancy to the story and they get consent maybe Maybe there's some sort of exchange of value uh, where where it wipes itself out, as in the movie is giving value to Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola says, hey, no problem. Just go ahead and use our logo. They're happy with it, and so is the movie. But maybe it goes the other way. Maybe the movie uh, isn't big enough that you know, Coca-Cola says no, and there's actually an, a, fee, a fee paid to Coca-Cola for the use of a logo. Right. Those are all things that happen. Now, automotive... Let's now. So, so we give you some 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 thoughts there. Generally, automotive and, and look, there are always the situations where a director's friend is the friend of this guy, or or um, you know, um, one of the actors owns one of the clothing companies or whatever it is, and somehow the logo is worked into the movie, stays in the edit, and um, and there's no issues there right right few and far between so like in automotive it's slightly different automotive doesn't have the type of money in exchange that a lot of these companies would necessarily have when you're talking about big product placements right because right. it's it's not as common of a thing to have in a show like or or a movie or something like that unless it's like specifically a car themed movie like you're not going to see um, you know, like Coney Wheels, for example, and like a love romance, like type of movie, you know, right. like, 
Right. <laughs> not, like, not usually. It, it, it has happened. There, there are, you know, listen, here's the thing that in the, in the Hollywood scene is that there are a lot of uh, movie car houses and production studios, and their entire job is to take care of, you know, the different vehicles and, and stuff like that. And what they'll do is some of them, they actually build a lot of cars and have a lot of inventory uh, on on their in their company in their lots they're usually the ones that would rent out all the police cars to uh you know to a movie buses right. taxis etc right um then there's going to be uh production houses that are working on specific films and and this a good case in point uh was the fast and the furious films they always had until they got to i think and i'm, I'm could be wrong on this um but until they got to think fast and furious uh 4 i think majority of those things were really um there was on uh, the on site which uh you know production thing that was making the cars but there was a lot of external um you know production houses that were actually involved in tracking these cars down you know they would have meetings in, at universal and and they would say, oh, okay, well, you know, guys, here's the cars we need. And these guys would run down these cars and try to find product placement in the thing. Because right. think about it like this. From a movie budget perspective, Fast and the Furious, like, even on the cars that were considered extras. Like, you you all know the hero cars, right? When when, when Paul uh, Paul Walker was in the R34, the blue R34, when he's in, you know, the Eclipse in the first movie, um, you know, all these different, you know, the hero cars. And, yeah, they'll have eight of them. But remember that depending on where a car is getting used, uh, like Fast and Furious 1 was a different thing. They didn't really have the budget. But what they ended up doing was like all the cars in a lot of the race scenes were extras. They called them in. They were real guys from L.A. area. Nice. They didn't have that budget. And they would just kind of fit in. So there was that. That's pretty but cool. But then as the movie escalated, they started to happening? get more budget and, and were able to to start well, pulling in like production they house got cars. more budget they got more budget they had clout because now the first movie was a smash right and then on top of it what ended up happening was um now they had these production houses that were in charge in these groups and these people that were in charge of trying to get cars that would be in different spots and secure products for them throughout the automotive industry to get the cars built because or for example, an extra car. Let's say one car, and a good a, the good example I can think of this was uh, Fast and the Furious 3. Tokyo three. Drift. No, that was 2. No. Was that 2 or 3? I'm, That's I'm three. losing it now. All right, so let's go to, I think it's 4 then. It's the with, one with where... With the blue R34? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. It's the one where, yes, because it's the one where Paul Walker's an FBI agent. Yeah. Okay, so so that one, that was the last movie, that was the last Fast and Furious that we decided that we were going to help with product on. Um, and we, I remember we had, there was probably about seven or eight different cars in the movie that actually had our product on it. And when you gave for some of these cars, you know, sometimes you get lucky and they were background cars or whatever it was and... They would only need like, you know, two sets of wheels for those cars. But like one of the car scenes, and it's really tough, and I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, like, for example, the um, there's a part where Paul, Work Paul, Paul Walker chases Vin Diesel into um, into an apartment building on, on the street. And he's and Vin Diesel's hanging a guy out the window. Right. I don't know if you remember this. All right. Yeah. So right before they go into the scene, the guy that's hanging out the window, he was driving a 240SX. It's a like 240. brown. Yeah, it's like brown and gold and black and has yellow stripes. And right. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. They, so we... They, they only show it for like a split second. Like it's outside the, the dude's house. Yeah, uh, yep. And you don't, you don't see it for the rest of the movie. Right. So that car we had wheels on. Now, right. that car ends up getting blown up or smashed at some point. Now, well, remember that just because you didn't see it doesn't mean they oh, didn't yeah. do it. Okay. Um, 
So for that car alone, we ended up having to give eight sets of wheels. And they didn't even put it in the movie. <laughs> well, so which, which we'll get into why it was the last, last Fast and the Furious that we bothered with. Um, so anyhow, bottom line is what ends up happening here is um, we, we give all these wheels away and they put them on the car and we had all these pictures that they sent us of the car getting smashed by trucks, the car getting thrown up in the air, the car getting smashed again. I mean, we had all these great pictures, but it didn't have any real legitimacy because the final cut of the movie was very, very quick cut of, of that car uh, in totality. And so we did that car. We, we had done a couple extra cars. Um, so, there was so also... I, I was actually about to ask you about that. Um, and I, I guess it's a little bit different because they just didn't sh like have it in but how noticeable i mean at least at least i don't really pay attention to the wheels that are on the cars um how noticeable is the like product placement like that you know so so and that and that brings us that brings us kind of full circle to the to the question and the the debate right right see see the thing is when it comes down to product placement and um and being in movies, right? On the Fast and the Furious one, uh, the first Fast and Furious, um, the Jetta, if you look at the white Jetta, it was one of the hero cars. It's a car Jesse drove. That, right. has, Coney, that has Coney tantrums on it, right? So, uh, so that car was covered. Um, a lot of people uh, redo the Eclipse in the, scene, in the movie and they'll put, you know, verdicts on it. Um, but... The point I'm trying to make is that, yeah, that was that was a hero car, whatever it may be. Um, as they moved off of different things, you know, look, there's there's something about a movie that stereotypically has to do uh, the service of creating the right image, right? Like when you when you make a movie or when they do a movie, they're not looking for what may be the average Joe. They want to have you know, the stuff that's, um, you know, kind of seen in, in, in a certain light. So you'll right. see that they have a tremendous amount of it, maybe not in the first movie, but in a lot of different movies, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll see a lot of, um, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, bulk racing product or whatever it is, you know, worked into uh, different shots. Now, there's a couple reasons for that. One, um, I think stereotypically it, it you know it's it's kind of the the thing that people um, aspire to put on. It's the four you know what I mean. Like it's yeah. it's the forged big dollar stuff. Uh, also remember that a lot of the cars that became hero cars in later movies, um, they were sought out because they, you know or they weren't built necessarily for the movie. All the cars, some of the cars were other people's cars. So depending on where they came from that could have been one of those things um but what's interesting is so so like if i don't know let, let's say the 350z they took your z your specific z and they were like oh we need to also make replicas for this car just in case we need to do any stunts or blow it up or anything like that uh things like that so like they'll need they'll contact you and be like hey we need wheels because this car that we have has a these wheels on it yeah yeah gotcha and so and so they they may end up sourcing you know uh depending on how many times they intend to destroy a car they you know they may do a bunch of wheels a good example of this is if you look at gone in 60 seconds there's uh there's a couple clips where some of the hero cars take some really big shots and those cars had to have an excessive amount of, of wheels because they just continue to destroy cars. Um, so, so that stuff really happens. Um, and bottom line is, the one thing that comes up with this whole thing is, this is the piece that you don't see. When you are not a paid product placement in, in any movie or film or anything like that, a television show, the one thing that you're not really that you really don't understand as you start playing is that it doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter what you supplied. The agreement is there is no promissory uh, substance that your product will make it into, into the final, the final cut. cut. 
The final cut and the edit are usually solely based off of the executive producer and, uh, and the director, for the most part. And their artistic vision will bleed through. So if, if your whole scene that you did this whole thing just gets cut, you know, gone. Um, you know, it's just kind of like, hey, sorry. And sometimes you'll see them, you know, at the end of the movie, you look at the bottom of the credits, usually the last screen, the last part of the credits, it will say like, you know, special thanks to and they'll list companies. Right. Um, so after the Fast and the Furious 4, we had car in, in all, we had, we had cars and wheels in all of those movies. Um, you, wasn't it, uh, what was it? The Purple Eclipse in the second one? Yeah. Was that I one of them? So. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think Tyrese's Eclipse um, had had wheels on it. I'm trying to remember now. Uh, for Fast and Furious, the first Fast and Furious, um, the, the Jetta car. had, yeah, Jesse's car had wheels on it and a, bu- and a couple of different extra cars also. Um, those cars actually had the wheels on them already and we didn't really have anything to do with that. Um, the, let's see, um, first, uh, Fast and Furious 3, which movie was that? I'm now, uh, 3 is Tokyo Drift. Right. Um, I don't remember which cars, but anyhow, I think the first four movies, after the fourth movie, um, we kind of got together and we're like, look, like, where's the value here? Like, you put, we put, you know, tens and thousands of dollars of product, you know, up for, for the use of possibly being in a film that you don't really get any guarantees on. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Are the shots really worth it? Are they not? Um, there's a lot of stress. I mean, you know, with product, you know, it's funny. Like you may, let's say you supply 10 sets of wheels and then, you know, they, they burn through them too quickly. As in they miscalculate how many times they need to shoot something and they destroy these cars and the wheels are junk like you may get a call and they're like oh we need to air freight these wheels and like you know and it got to a point where it wasn't really uh worth it we've done plenty of television shows and different things like that um really not necessarily yeah not necessarily like in the same way you would think um what's interesting about the television shows is usually there's a there's special production houses that really do this stuff and they may just you start to develop a relationship with a lot of these guys you know they know that when the director of a, of a tv show or commercial says hey i need to have a black mustang and it needs to look like it's a hot rod like that's what they know and then they call these guys and these guys are like oh wait a minute i got a i got a, a thing at koenig hey can you do me a favor can you get me some wheels that are going to be this the directors really look for something in you know black whatever it is um and if you have it you send it off to them and it makes its way in but maybe not with logos and it's just the wheel. And, um, and a lot of times what's interesting about those guys is they usually end up having budget for cars. So sometimes they'll actually just look for a deal and buy the wheels on a deal. Nice. And then ask for permission to... It, I think it, it all comes with consent when you give them the wheels. You know? Well, I mean, I mean if they just buy wheels. Or, like they, or they would contact you and say, hey, this is what we're looking to do. Can we buy a set of wheels? Something right. Like that's that. a lot of a lot of times. That's how it happens. Now, the hardest part that we have with stuff like that is verifying that it's real. You know, and uh, and usually what ends up happening is those uh, they'll have some sort of blanket letter or whatever it may be that actually talks about um, uh, their relationship to the studio or whatever it is or the project or whatever, and they're able to send you that so you can confirm the legitimacy. So, yeah. Have, have you ever gotten fake uh, emails from people oh, saying, well, yeah, 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 absolutely. Saying, hey, I'm filming a movie. Can you send us 20 sets of wheels? Yeah. You know, so we don't get, to, well, not 20 sets of wheels, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get a set or two or whatever it may be. What's interesting is that when you start to look at, um, when you start to look at uh, some of the people that, that kind of get in touch with you, a lot of times they will be real. They'll say, oh, we're filming this show or we have this show coming out or whatever. But a lot of times they're filming um, uh, pilots as in the show doesn't exist yet. And yeah. when, when a lot of these shows start, they start in a stage of 
a lot of times it's the people that want to have their own show making the show. They put their own budget on the line. They, they spend all the money. They make the pilots. They develop the pilots. They edit the pilots. They f basically shop, shop them out to different production studios or whatever it may be. Right. And then um, once they get that all said and done, um, what they end up doing is then uh, if a network does pick it up, you know, you're kind of lucky, you know, like, you, you know, hey, I'm on the car, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, sometimes they don't pick them up. Uh, most of the time, 90% of the time, they don't pick them up. But if a pilot gets picked up, many times what happens is it starts regionally. So it may start in, you know, in the Southwest, and then they premiere the show, at, you know, three o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, on Discovery or something like that. Yeah, and if if it does well, then they give them a little bit more range, and then they move them to a little bit better of a time. And it could take years to get a pilot pushed through to the point where it gets picked up on like a regular station, right? And, and put out right. Okay. Now, the interesting part to me to sum up this whole conversation, and this is kind of the point of the conversation we have in the office uh, not too long ago, is. Is it worth it anymore to do this stuff? You know, and I, my personal opinion is that it's not. I think, yeah, I think that I'm, I was gonna say, I don't think so either. Like, especially, especially nowadays with like all the social media stuff, and like it's so easy to get your stuff viewed just by like you can potentially get a million people to see your product by just sending one set of wheels to like a social media influencer or, or something like that you know what i mean like it's it's a lot different than a, especially when those movies came out there like there wasn't that much of an easy social reach in your pocket you know so back then like i guess it really does make sense to where it's like yeah it's a little risky you know, I might lose out on it, but, you know, all these people might see this and it'll be in, like, this big movie or whatever. But, like, you can get the same view by sending the same amount of wheels to X amount of influencers or or really known people in the automotive industry to, you know, just get exposure. So, yeah, I don't really think it's worth it to to do stuff like that anymore. Yeah, I think it's difficult because, like, you know, like, you you made that point, and, and it's a valid point as far as a big picture from a marketing perspective. But I think that, and the one thing I think we've really seen over the years is that I think that there's, when you get involved, and this is probably a whole separate topic as it is, so I won't spend too much time on it. Right. But when you really get down to uh, trying to decide about, when you work with influencers or not, we have learned through many times, it's not good enough to find somebody that has a big audience, happens to whatever, and put product on vehicles. And um, it's really important that you find people that represent your brand well, that uh, can go out there and, um, and be good ambassadors for you, and you can develop long-term relationships with. And that's why... Right. We spend a lot of time turning down, um, you know, influencers. Um, you know, listen, you're always going to have relationships that when you start them, um, you, you, start, you start a relationship and, and it works. And then, you, you know, um, and then you start a relationship and sometimes it just doesn't work. But it's really important that, you know, like for us, like we're really now we're now even more than ever. We're extremely selective about who we work with. They have to share our vision. Their their audience has to kind of be, um, you know, pretty positive. Uh, you know, car people for the most part. That we look for a lot of content and influencers that are are, are really putting a lot of instructional or educational value. Um, so, on what they do, you know. So let me ask you this: Do you think it's, um. What was I going to say? I forgot. Oh, um, it's still more valuable though. Or do you think it's still more valuable instead of doing a movie to sponsor somebody? 
um, like uh, like a driver or somebody to actually build a relationship with and not just have stuff like featured in the movie for a split second or even if it's on like, you know, a, an, an entire car. Also, another question I had was, what like how is the effect on that? Like, did you see a good ROI on on putting those wheels in those movies? Look, I personally, I don't, I personally don't ever really think um, that we did. Now, with that said, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it would probably have been a very difficult time. I, you know, I wasn't with, you know, Koenig until. Um, 2000, you know, the late part of 2005, I think, I believe. Um, and, and basically, um, oh, was it early 2006? I don't know. Anyhow, bottom line is, um, you know, the first Fast and Furious was during this boom where Koenig was really, really, really popular. And because of that, um, you know, it was all part of that whole thing. That whole hot import nights, nopey, um, you know, Fast and the Furious, that whole thing, that whole, you know, incredible, you know, import boom, as people sometimes refer to it, that's its own, that's its own thing, you know, and, and it'd be really hard to quantitatively say, oh, there, you know, that this contributed to X amount of ROI, but, um, you know, I think when you start talking about ROI, it it's very different now than it ever was before. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it used to be um, a very different type of uh, return you were looking for, and and now I think that you're foolish as a company if you think that you're going to um, play the short term game. If you think that you're going to be able to put product on a car, give YouTube pro- uh, an influencer product, uh, do anything and get a quick hit of success or return on investment. I think it's a foolish, foolish move. It's my personal opinion. I'm not telling you I'm right. I'm just telling you my personal opinion is that you, the companies I believe that will do well are the companies that build long-term relationships, look for valuable people, don't take every every opportunity that walks through the door, but take the opportunities that you really feel align with your total vision and, and, and kind of your uh, own brand outlook. And I think that the value in return on investment isn't necessarily something that you can just quantify in terms of how many people came to my website or how many people um, uh, you know, click this link or how many people bought this wheel. I think it's, it's a, it's an extremely poor judge. Um, I think it's an extremely poor judgment call to use a metrics that's only of these, you know, kind of very, I don't want to call them superficial numbers, but very, um, deliverable, you know, numbers based off of executions to judge an entire relationship or a venture solely. I think it's really diff I think it's I think it's a bad move, you know. So then with with Fast and Furious, I mean, I mean you weren't part of it, but I wonder what the thought process is and um you know, if have, have there been movies since you started? Like have have there been movies where you're like, "All right, we're going to send out like a set of wheels." Like, is it the same from your experience where you're building a relationship with a movie? Um, whether or not they'll, like how, like, how does that work? Like, do you have to think, oh, maybe they'll have a sequel or maybe this production house will hire us again or the, the middle person who's hiring us for the film, maybe we'll have a good relationship with them and they're the ones that you know, maybe that movie doesn't have a sequel, but being that the production house hired us, they'll send us into other movies. Like, what? How? What is the the relationship that gets built there? If it even works the same, like for movies as it does, like you know, for for like our drivers and stuff. So you know, I think I think the I think in a weird way, my outlook has been shaped by all the mistakes that maybe I've ever been part of. 
right? Okay. Like, and I think that that's, that's, again, that's what shapes my outlook. That's what shapes my vision. And this is all my personal opinion. So, um, but every mistake we've ever done where we haven't had the right result or it wasn't a good look or, um, or even maybe some of the successes that we've had, these are the things that have shaped my opinion about what I think is valuable and not. And to go back to your point of what you just said, my opinion is that the value is really in the people and the contacts that you meet through these movies. It's maybe less to met less about the the actual um, did did my logo get seen for two seconds or three seconds? Was the wheel have a close up? Whatever it is, and I believe it's more about. The guy that, the, the, you know, the production house or the guy that's doing a lot of these builds for the movies, you know, can I, am I making a good relationship there where I know that, you know, I can help him and make his job easier and he'll do his best to make sure that when he feels something's valid, he'll call me. Um, and I think those relationships will, are beneficial because there's such a long-term value in there. There will always be a hit or miss opportunity. There will always be something you declined and it ends up doing really well and something you rolled into and it doesn't do, you know, um, and it doesn't do well. Right. Um, I also think that there will also be that those breakout hits that, you know, like if you had put a car on one of the Fast and Furious cars, you know, when when the movie was considered wasn't Fast and Furious, it was Redline before they made the movie. You know, if you were on, you know, one of Craig Lieberman's cars back in the day or whatever it was when they when they started this this film and didn't really know where it would go, um, you know, you hit the jackpot as a company right. because you were on a car that wasn't, it wasn't in a movie. It became iconic. Right. It was replicated by every toy company and and ch- kid and, and, so, and personal. So now your so wheel. Those so, things are on so, another so level. So now your wheels and, and or product kind of or like, whatever is not only in this movie, but it's also on the toys and in photos or right. or whatever. Yeah, I mean, listen, and 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 sometimes you're really fortunate to make great relationships. And I have a good example of one right here. Oh, well, maybe. Um, like you know, we had a relationship for years with. With with Hot Wheels, and I, I'm not going to show their whole logo, so we don't have to blur it out. But, um, but you know, like you know, I mean, I have and I have a bunch of these toys. I actually have a, a whole box full of different toys that we've made. With but Coney you know, if you look, um, yeah, I don't know if you can if you could see it. Can you see it? Are, are those free forms? It's right down there. It's no, no, I, no. This is a long time I, ago. I can't see. Um, I understand. Um, but it, you know, anyhow, bottom line is. Um, it was a Civic SI uh, in 2008. We had built the 2006 one for Honda um, uh, one year when they launched the SI in 2006. It was red, but, um, but they ended up kind of you know, running with, with this, and we had some good relationships there. So uh, you know, look, there's a lot of relationships that you'll meet and you'll go through, and, and you'll do some really cool things. And I think if you play... Uh, the long-term game, I think it's a good look. And I'll tell you another story is that, you know, there's a saying that, uh, in, especially in automotive, that um, it's not, um, you know, the faces don't change, but the business cards do, right? Right. People constantly move throughout the industry in different companies. So, you know, the odds, you know, the odds that you know one person um, and if you're, you know, become you know, have a good relationship with them, don't screw them, do what you say you're going to do and, and different things that they'll move on to five or six different companies. And a lot of these guys, you know, 12, 15, 20 years down the line, you know, they end up being, you know, pretty higher ups at some of these companies. And that's how you end up developing these lifelong relationships where, um, you know, you develop trust and, and, and get, you know, some really interesting and, and great opportunities, you know? Right. That's cool. So, Anyhow. It's a really, really quick last last thing. Like that's a really cool thing to think about. Yeah. Like, um, not, not well. Obviously, what we just said about like building relationships and all that stuff, but also like, you know, what a movie could lead into other things. Like, you got toys from it mm-hmm. or, or whatever. Like, that's really dope. Um, 
And yeah, that's an, that's another valid point you have as far as like the whole relationship building thing, because like, you know, you can build a relationship with I don't know the it it could just be like the dude that that calls wheel companies and like his job is to organize he's like secretary or something and then mm -hmm. before you know it like you built a relationship with him and now he's head of that production company and he's like oh like I want to I want Koenig wheels on every single thing or like I want to help these guys out or like whatever they need like I got them you know that's another resource that you have so that's pretty cool to think about yeah yeah I think there's and I think there's a lot of relationships like that and I think we've been pretty fortunate to to build a lot of those relationships and, and plenty of other companies will too. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like it's, it's just us. There's plenty yeah. of opportunities that exist, but, um, you know, look, you know, I, th I think it's just one of those things, you know, um, whenever you, whether it be sponsorship or films or whatever it is, you know, do, do your best to, you know, be a good person and try to do the right thing. And, you know, usually, you know, the long term uh, results are, are much better, but yeah. So, I mean, so anyhow, so, so back to the whole circling back here, um, you know, movies, television, the whole thing, I think that, you know, especially nowadays they're, you know, they're probably for the right companies, there's going to be good opportunity there, you know, for maybe companies like us and, and stuff like that. I don't really think it's worth uh, you know, my personal opinion, it's not really necessarily worth the investment. Um, but I think that there's a lot of, you know, influencers or people out there that have great content, that have great um, audiences and good bases and are doing great things and building good projects and showing a lot of people uh, that are car enthusiasts about some really interesting uh, and cool things, you know what I mean? And giving them a lot of educational base that they wouldn't be able to get anywhere else. Right. And I think there's two things that I really believe about those types of influencers. Um, one is that there's a lot of good people out there and the fact that they're connecting their, um, their channel with, with, with that base, I think is fantastic. And two, the fact that they're really educating enthusiasts you know, to to inspire other people to do some of these builds as wacky as they are. You know, I, I think of one of, you know, one of the guys that I, I, I think is, you know, we've really connected with uh, well and I respect a lot is Chris from BS for Build, right? Um, he's a great guy. He does a lot of incredible projects. And, you know, with Chris, you get to learn even when he makes mistakes. Right. You know what I mean? Like... This isn't Bob Vila showing you how to build a house. This is a car guy that's seriously, you know, you can watch on, on YouTube, you can watch his documented progression of building cars and, and fabricating and the whole thing. And, you know, when he messes up, you can see him, you know, I mean, uh, you know, drink, drink a beer and then laugh it off as he tries to redo all his work. But, um, but, but I think what's interesting is that Chris is, genuinely uh, you know for for people who don't, he's a genuine great guy i mean super great guy has never screwed us um always does the right thing um and it's no pro pressure like we don't i don't get into i don't tell him what to do he doesn't uh, you know he sometimes he asks me what he wants but a lot of times he has his own vision for the projects um you know uh, i help him where we help where we can and um you know, because of that, we've just developed a good relationship. And not every project has our stuff on it. We don't, we don't, you know, push him to do any of that stuff. He he decides when he thinks it's appropriate and wherever that is, that's good for us. You know. Yeah, it's cool. So, um, yeah. yeah, I like I I I put the relation to to social media and and YouTubers and stuff like that uh, only because I like I was thinking of specifically with the Fast and Furious stuff, like how it was then and like how it would be kind of different now and like what about like, you know, people that make uh, films on YouTube or, or stuff like that. And then I was like, oh, YouTube influencer. And that's kind of how like I made the the connection. Yeah. But yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, the, there's, no, there's no doubt that the connection that you made was very, you know, like back then, you know, going back, you know, 50, you know 10, 15 years, 
magazines, uh, magazines, um, movies, television. That was that was primarily where you would look for uh, for exposure. Right. And you know, and then obviously there was some website things and forum things and stuff like that. And then you know later there was social media, um, but you know you're right today you know the viewership and the consumption of of people is far different than it ever was before and and you know the internet and and youtube and social media and different things like that it holds a different amount of weight and that's where the eyeballs are so um there's no doubt that companies are gonna you know shift shift their where they're looking to to make their exposure but um, I think there's still plenty of good stories and um, um, and good lessons kind of in all of those mediums. If in they all kind of surmise the same thing, which is you know make sure that you uh, play the long term game if you're looking for long term success, right? Yeah. So I don't know. Um, let's see before we get out of here. It's uh, Friday. Nick has something coming for you. Finally, it's actually gonna happen. <laughs> Hope it's so. It's gonna happen. Uh, we've been trying to we've been trying to put out every, uh, something out every Friday. Last Friday we faux pawed. We we had something come out on Thursday, and then we went to get something up on Friday. We had some technical glitches, and um, we just decided to parlay it. So yeah. this Friday it will be there. Right. It's it ready. There. It's good to go. It's coming your way. Yep. It's coming your way. So Friday, make sure you check it out. And if you're still with us uh, and you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, we'd greatly appreciate it if you did. And the notification bell is a lovely thing. It actually will let you know every time we put something up, which is, you know, it's good. You know, I, you know give it a shot. See, see how it works. Let us, in fact, comment below how it works on, on the video after you click the notification bell. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> What? <laughs> I, lo- I, I, right. I, I love, uh, I love the shameless plugging. <laughs> that's that's all I have left in you life. And we'll, we'll do. I'll, I'll go one step further. Head over to our Instagram. Head over to TikTok and go follow us on both of those platforms. Facebook, like us. Go to our website. Just do it all. Do it all. <laughs> wow. I was just asking for a simple subscribe and a notification bell, Nick, to ask you to click all that stuff. So below, tell us who's your favorite. Uh, is it me or Nick? <laughs> All right. Um, I say we get out of here. What do you think? Yeah, wrap, wrap it up, Scott. Close All right. this out. For more information on the podcast, head over to KonigWills.com forward slash podcast. And um, I don't know. Make sure you stay tuned to Friday. We're going to have some stuff up. Uh, if you don't follow us on Instagram, well, I'm sure you do. But if you don't, head over there. And... Um, I don't know. That's it. We will be back here with you next Wednesday. Uh, So take care.